when Paul attended me to give a talk here, uh, this was our biggest problem in December and uh, about me, but this is not really interesting. So what I consider me at the moment is a cloud security architect. So I give advice how to um, create applications in the cloud in a secure way. Uh, the other things don't really matter. So I'm involved in a project at the moment for, for vaccinations. This is going live now. Um, but that's not important. Motivation uh, of this is uh, I want to show you four example projects uh, which have completely different approaches from a uh, project structure and, and, uh, uh, and on the uh, community side. I want to show you some flaws of the open source development which nobody is uh, to blame for, but we definitely have flaws if it comes to security. Then I want to introduce the sovereign tech fund and uh, talk about other things which are, in my opinion, important at the moment for security. Uh, unfortunately, we have more, no other problems. So uh, there's a war a few hundred kilometers away here. And last week, it happened that uh, some modems have been bricked. So we had 11 gigawatts of wind turbine power not controlled anymore which was not a big deal, but uh, breaking and um, replacing these modems is something really important. Uh, what nobody really uh, noticed is that the European crisis management uh, had the same satellite connections as this wind turbine. So if we would have an emergency in Europe, which needed to be coordinated, we would have been without connection. Uh, everybody is downplaying this, especially the military. So this is the good news. This is not something they consider as appropriate for NATO Article 5. Mm. But uh, some other people uh, jumped in, especially anonymous. They uh, pretend to take over gas control systems or they hacked Rosneft. And just a remark in the beginning, this is a total stupid idea because especially attribution of this um, things is really hard. Who is doing this? Everybody who is attacking infrastructure in a foreign country is a legitimate target of war. And attacking civil infrastructure, and even if you attack something, a gas pipeline in Russia, it's a war crime. So please stay defensive if you do this. Protect your own system and don't go into foreign country because everybody is really nervous. There was a conference in 2020 uh, about uh, defensive cons. So simply IT security in a defensive way. Please follow uh, the advice on this conference that you uh, definitely try to protect your systems first and not go into a, a tech mode. What my business is, is uh, this is a Wikipedia picture. I'm re responsible for deploying systems, controlling the transmission grid, the high voltage grid, which is below, uh, beyond 110 kilovolts. So this is critical infrastructure. It's highly regulated. Failure is not really an option. We would have a blackout or even a partial blackout, which is uh, causing problems. But uh, this is something which also is starting to use open source heavily. This is all my personal motivation. And then what really happened to Log4j shell, it's not even a bug. Uh, what I have looked up is, has been specified in 1997. Um, and the actual flaw is buried and then many layers of code. There was a um, talk at Black Hat 2016. Uh, nobody noticed this, and uh, it's actually easy to exploit. You see new variants every day, for example, in Apache Chainsaw or con in connection with JDBC. So this is really a serious bug. And what if you are only a developer? Only is not in a way that uh, you should be concerned. But if you are a developer uh, and not an IT admin, you see and you don't notice 
how busy admins are at the moment. They are close to burnout and they are not always able to patch systems. We have ab abandoned organizations, for example, in a very well-known Berlin hospital, which has ongoing data loss because there is no staff who can fix this log4j flaws. I estimated that even in the first weeks, you have a 100 million euro loss of money just in workload um, according to this um, log4j shell bug. This is a normal thing at the moment. So then uh, Adriana Gro approached me and this was a study about uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund. I will explain later what it is. And the study is based on the work of Adriana, Eileen Wagner, Fiona Krattenberger, Felix Reda, and Katharina Meyer. Felix Reda gave, gave a keynote last year with a little help from uh, Marco Alexander Breit and Tara Tarakie from OpenSFF and Susanne Probost and myself. So, personal disclaimer, I've been paid for this, a few days of consulting work. This was a side job, end of August, beginning of September last year, and the examples are not representative, representative but on my daily experience. And <clears throat> what I notice is digital sovereignty is um, not well defined. Uh, I always would start with digital competence. There is governmental versus individual sovereignty. So the government understands something completely different than you as a person. I personally see it also a label for a Trojan horse to get free and open source software into the government organizations. <coughs> Here you have this iconic picture and nobody knows who actually the person is on which the entire world relies. So this is Ariadna Cornell claiming it last October. And she's not from Nebraska, is from, from Oklahoma. And she has made major comp um, contributions to open source since 2003 or something like this. Uh, what Ariadna does now I did an interview with her. She does a lot of things in embedded Linux. Uh, for Alpine Linux, there is no GLBC, so this is effectively a GNU-less Linux. They are basing on a completely different library, libmusl, not the uh, GNU library. And it's effectively very small. It's eight megabyte on top of the kernel. It's a fork of an embedded appliance, has a different uh, startup system. It's very container friendly. So there are more than one billion containers using this at the moment running in production and it is easy to harden. Container hardening is important because everybody is using containers, especially the German administration will roll out containers on scale. Uh, containers are starting to run in critical infrastructure. So German critics there's a video of my last uh, uh, link there, how I hack into container systems if they are not well um, prepared. There's a lot of support, for example, by Google and so on. Another example is uh, Ernest Durbin. Uh, he is not the person, but he is doing a very important job because he runs the PyP um, directory. So he is effectively uh, responsible for 435,000 packages uh, on PyPy, and he runs this entire ecosystem on a side job. He has a lot of good ideas, but he does not have the time uh, to do this, to execute all these ideas in a, in a structured manner. PyPy is, uh, or Python as a programming language, is the number one at the moment. It runs nearly everywhere from controllers to uh, artificial intelligence systems, and there is uh, some initiative to get this into critical infrastructure. And therefore, if it runs in critical infrastructure, it is important and needs a high level of security. Attacking Python is easy. We had several typo squatting attacks, so simple people 
just uploading uh, packages with uh, typos in it. We had dependency confusion. Somebody is uploading packages with a very high version number. And there are lots of uh, security checks necessary. This could also attack Ruby, gems, uh, on the NPM. The mitigation uh, Ernest proposes, you use virtual trusted and audited sub-repositories. Python runs in struct exchange systems, critical infrastructure, and so on. Next example I've interviewed is uh, Werner Koch. He is the main person behind GPG, so the encryption system uh, which works everywhere. And in 2015, he announced they are running out of funds. This is some project which is really important because all the crypto systems in every distribution are based on GPG. He now got a funding by Rode and Schwarz, but effectively he told me that uh, yeah, they get audits paid by Red Hat, but they don't have the staff and the time to uh, fix the code and the flaws detected in an audit and the documentation is two or three years behind. So this is something which is really concerning. Next thing is, I think he was yesterday in, uh, on the online conference, uh, Christian Ketty. He created K9 Mail, which is a mailer using encryption for Android. He is one of the early members of the Android Stammtisch, which is now a Google Android user group or something like that. Seabase member, so local. I know him very well, and he is one of the persons who are maintaining a package more or less alone. What is missing here is the Apache Foundation, because you would imagine if you have uh, this impressive list of uh, features, then everything is fine. So most of the code is Java code. You think uh, Java, uh, IBM, Red Hat, Oracle are behind this. So this is everything you need and everything is fine, everything is clear. No, Log4j has surprised us a little bit that uh, even if you have this impressive list of uh, references, you are not safe from uh, fatal flaws. Uh, and effectively, the three people behind uh, this are very uh, are, uh, maintaining Log4j as a side job, which is surprising, but uh, it works. And I think uh, they don't want to do this in a different way. So the scale is from project size from nearly a single developer uh, to number one programming language, everything in between, machine size from microcontrollers to supercomputers. Criticality is from fun, fun projects to, yeah, it's funds in critical infrastructure. And the payment is somewhere between unpaid hobbyists and fully employed. So we have a lot of diversity in size and structure of projects. And if you talk to these people, yes, we are well-funded. Nobody says, yeah, mm, no, we are not well-funded. But effectively, no, you are not well-funded if your code runs in critical infrastructure. Because what you need is, uh, in security-relevant systems, you will need a long-term financial perspective. You need code reviews. You need a lot of resources beyond coding, maintenance, bug fixing. Maintenance of older versions, especially, you need a lot of documentation, testing, and somebody should care about architecture fixes. So JNDI, in my domain, Kubernetes, you have this uh, service account token, which is notoriously insecure. You need communication. What I've learned in, an open, in the vaccination project is communication is a full-time project, a full-time job in a project. Here are some other architecture flaws uh, I found in Kubernetes mostly. You see a lot of things are uh, running somehow code from somewhere else without checking, without signature. And this is a, this is a real problem.
Uh, you can rewrite it or replace it. For example, you could, this age, which is a related project signing things, uh, or rage in Rust. Um, we always have this key life cycle problems, which in the internet have been a little bit uh, solved by let's encrypt. And um, proposal is to do this with six store, which is uh, a way of doing let's encrypt for supply chains. This is something new and uh, this is what I promote to my customers as a default. So please, if you run the supply chain, be sure that you know what you are running, sign everything and run only signed code somehow. And the signing must be meaningful. Uh, when I talk to the industry, um, then I hear, oh, enterprise companies don't have a problem to invest 5% of their project cost in open source maintenance. But what they then ask me, but how do we know what we are actually using? And then I ask them, so this is in your software bill of materials in your SBOM, but they don't have any. So um, this is one of the outcomes we need to enforce that everybody who is in critical infrastructure uh, has an, uh, is running open source projects on scale needs this kind of bills of material and must be aware and then you could just give money to the projects which are announced in your SBOM. Another thing is what we see is we need to handle this security bugs carefully. This must be a responsible disclosure process. There is no other way of doing things, mm. but if you look into China, China has a completely different approach to sovereignty. Um, Alibaba was punished because they um, reported the flaw not to the government first. So this is a real problem. The communities must be aware that they are able to set up a responsible disclosure process. Now to the sovereign tech form. This is the English version. The German version is also ahead. This is a study how to fund uh, to create a funding program for open digital based technology. So these are base technologies like the open SSF does for uh, open SSL. And uh, we need this for a lot of other projects. The mission statement is here. Development, improvement and maintenance of base technologies. And the goal is to strengthen the open source ecosystem, not to create something new, but to help the open source ecosystem to reach these goals. Focus here is on security, resilience, and technological diversity, that we are not only rely on a single technology, but have a replacement in the case um, the first technology fails. And this is the structure of the process. So you have a, in the center, you have a database of software components. Uh, the database is filled by scouting and monitoring. So people will go around and look for uh, projects which are in critical infrastructure and need help. And then other people can apply for this. So if you, if you see here that you have uh, uh, and this additional selection process there, you can simply say, okay, I consider my project as critical and if they agree, you get also into this database of uh, software components and get kind of funding. The problem was you, on the one side, you need to support big projects like the Apache project. On the other side, you might have single person projects which could also be important in this ecosystem. My command is, yeah, it effectively, it's a good starting point. We are not focusing on innovation. There are other fundings. Uh, leveraging is not included, but 10 million at the beginning is quite a number. Uh, if I compare this to the Log4J damage, okay, we could do more, but the industry is ready to support this funding at, in, in that moment that then knowing what they are doing. And if you compare this with other, with other projects, it's uh, not 
the biggest number you can have. It's comparable to the open SSF funding or half of the open tech funding, which also includes Radio Free Asia, so it's not exactly comparable. So this is a good starting point. What is missing? Innovation, this is intended. Uh, we don't uh, support here new crypto. We don't uh, have privacy aware uh, things like privacy preserving uh, protocols or something like this, but this is also intended. Just before Christmas, uh, the new government confirmed, yes, we want to support this. And this is one of the Secretary of State, Franziska Brandner, of the new government. And they want to support these open source based technologies. This is the good news. And we should align with um, the open SFF counterpart that we simply share the work that the open SFF so, uh, supported projects are complementary to the projects we do here in Germany. There is the new initiatives which make totally sense. And we should have some directives like this uh, US government zero trust cybersecurity um, memorandum just to get things like zero trust out of uh, the experimental stages and make it the default in the next years. So this looks like a program for years, I would say at least 10 years. And uh, yeah, hopefully this will start this year and in a good way address um, open source security. It has reasonable budgets, details, need to be defined, what we see or what will come out, hopefully as soon as possible. And yes, I think this is the end of the talk and I'm open for questions. So thank you, Thomas. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay. So, Particularly on the sovereign tech fund, um, what is the story and how was the reception of the topic of tools? Because most of the time, the, there's a lot of talk about components and making sure that libraries are secure, but there's not that much of a conversation about how do we build these things. Like, um, effectively, this was a little bit hidden. So this is, uh, I mentioned it shortly, this is a six door project that is in completely new initiative of uh, doing secure supply chains, mainly driven um, by people who created startups like ChainGuard, for example. So you can have, uh, you have already allies in the open source community. And interestingly, um, a lot of people from Alpine Linux are here in Germany and even in Berlin. So we have people, uh, very close to us and uh, at the moment it's, in my opinion, the tools are an example, it's too early uh, to talk about final tooling, but um, the mindset is going into the right direction. Just to be clear, when I was talking about tools, I was talking about compilers and IDEs and less supply chain tooling. Yeah, it's about, so it doesn't matter if you sign a container with Scopio or with Cosign, but it should be signed and it should only be run if it is signed, to be clear. Are there any more questions? Yeah. Do you think that the uh, roots of the foundations might be part of the problem? Like I have an example, I'm part of an Apache project and we got a dedicated donation for money for our project, but Apache didn't allow us to spend it on development work, but more just on like test devices, infrastructure and stuff like this. This is part of the problem. So the, the, um, the communities must be able to receive money. And this is not the case in the moment, but they, uh, as far as I understood, Merle and Isabel, they are changing the rules at the moment, but I've not seen a final um, conclusion on that. So, so the communities must receive money. And if you look into the Apache Foundation, who should audit all this uh, code of the Apache Foundation? This can only be done on a project 
by project base. So another project has to review uh, a code of a different project. So this, otherwise it does, would not work. If we, if we would audit all the code externally, then it would take years and uh, nobody can actually do the work. And this must, the community must be able to improve itself. So the community must be um, able to review it internally. And a security audit is never something you will like, but if it is done smoothly and by colleagues you know, or in a neighbor project, it's better than you have an external auditor every two or five years. That does not really make sense. Okay, are there any more questions from the audience? So, um I see these different like OpenSSF and this Sovereign Tech Fund and also there was this uh, UN fund they discussed earlier. Uh, but it's very hard for me to kind of decipher how much of this money would actually go into paying maintainers for their work. So, so it's actually sustainable for them to do this it, work. Um, yeah, this, this is not uh, completely defined because you also need to do audits. Uh, the maintainers must be paid, especially if you have a long-term version or a version which is not actively um, developed anymore, but it is, might be very active in some parts of the critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure has sometimes software which is run 20 years or 30 years. So I've seen Windows 95 systems recently, which is not what I want to see, but um, this, this means you need to organize uh, long time maintenance and you have to pay somebody preferred from the community, but it can also be external support. Uh, whoever can can deliver this this work. <laughs>